Now, there seems to have been a fair bit of excitement in the world of politics over the last few weeks. Apparently, there's been a leadership contest going on. I'm, I'm not talking about the one involving George, Boris and Theresa. Uh, that one already feels like it's been running forever. A bit like the X Factor, only fewer laughs and no doubt you'll make your own minds up about the level of talent. But I'm referring, of course, to the leadership of the Labour Party. And I'm sure that you will join me in giving our warmest congratulations, not just to Jeremy and Tom, but to what we've now seen is the new shadow cabinet the first ever majority women shadow cabinet in history. <laughs> After the disappointment of the general election results, I think few people would have dreamed that we would see so many, especially young people, cramming into town halls and community halls, wanting to get involved in politics. Few would have dared that Labour had a chance of becoming a genuinely mass political party once again. But make no mistake, leading Labour and making it fit to fight for power again is a serious job and it's a tough job. Now, I'm all too aware that the one thing any new leader never lacks is offers of advice. Nevertheless, I would make this observation. A political party has to be a good deal more than a fan club. Its success depends on membership unity and mutual respect. It's got to reach well beyond its own ranks and appeal to the country at large. And it must have a higher collective purpose beyond that of any one individual or any one constituency of interest. Now, Labour's purpose is clear, to deliver wealth and opportunity to the many and not the few. But that means winning a general election to deliver it. So now the contest is over. On behalf of working people, my message to Labour is this. Look sharp, pull together, and do what working people are crying out for Her Majesty's opposition to do. Get stuck in and oppose. <laughs> Show the grit, the discipline, and the determination needed to win back economic trust, win back political power, and change Britain for the better. Now, if you just look around this hall, you will find workers from all walks of life, people whose labour creates the wealth on which Britain's future depends. We've got scientists and engineers coming up with inventive solutions to climate change, manufacturing and construction workers rebuilding Britain, entertainers and educators who inspire the next generation, high tech, energy and transport workers, not forgetting the people's posties who work come rain, come shine to network the nation. And we've got dedicated NHS staff who tend our sick. And listen up, Mr. Hunt, they already cover seven days a week. Now, the slogan for this TUC Congress is great jobs for everyone, and it isn't complicated. That means fair pay, it means secure contracts, time to spend with your family, a voice at work, and respect for a, a job well done. But Britain's unions don't just want a fair share of the cake. We know we have to grow that cake too building a sustainable recovery, raising investment and productivity, and yes, raising wages and living standards too. We want a practical plan to deliver fair shares and greener growth for all. Now you would think that's what any government would want too, but this government would have to then come up with some fresh ideas. After all, we've already had 
five years of their failed remedy. Remember when they told us that austerity would wipe the slate clean? The Chancellor slashed taxes for the idle rich and slashed benefits for the working poor. But we still have a current account deficit on a scale unprecedented in peacetime. We still have the slowest recovery on record. And our balance of trade just keeps getting worse. But there is a better plan for Britain. And the government should want to talk to businesses and unions about how to deliver it. Now, I wrote to the Prime Minister just after the election, offering on your behalf to do just that. You would think that a Prime Minister who says his is the party of blue-collar workers would want to meet the leaders of real unions representing millions. But nearly 18 weeks later, I still haven't even received the courtesy of a reply. And uh, this one, I think, by the way, number 10, can't pin this one on Dave Ward and his members. So it seems to me that this government's top priority isn't getting Britain back on its feet. Instead, it wants to cut Britain's unions off at the knees. Barely had the Conservatives took office than they published their trade union bill. Now, earlier this year, the Prime Minister went to Washington to pay homage uh, to the civil rights leader, Martin Luther King. He visited his monument. He called him the great man. But he doesn't seem to know much about Dr King, his beliefs, or what he stood for. So I want to share with you, here's what Dr King said about trade unions. He said, and I quote, the labour movement does not diminish the strength of a nation, but enlarges it. By raising the living standards of millions, labour miraculously created a market for industry and lifted the whole nation to undreamed levels of production. Those who attack labour forget these simple truths, but history remembers them. Well, delegates, history will remember this Conservative government's trade union bill as the biggest attack in more than 30 years, not just against trade unions, but against our best chance of raising productivity, pay and demand. Because here is a simple truth. You can't create wealth without the workforce. And you can't spread that wealth around fairly without trade unions. So I make no apologies for defending strong trade unions, including making sure that workers have the right to strike if they need to. If an employer believed that workers couldn't strike, they wouldn't bother to bargain. We wouldn't have safe workplaces, we wouldn't have paid holidays. And let's remember, delegates, let's remember those brave Ford sewing machinists. We wouldn't have the right to equal pay either. Of course no one takes the decision to strike lightly. It's the root of last resort when your employer just won't talk, won't negotiate, won't compromise. Just ask the steel workers who balloted for strike action. They wanted to protect their pension scheme. Now, like most ballots, it led to a settlement without anyone ever having to walk out. But does anyone really believe the employer would have got back around the table if the unions hadn't given notice of a strike? All just to protect a decent income in old age. And they won. Or ask the Hovis workers. When staff saw new starters employed on zero-hours contracts, they were appalled. How can you raise a family, run your life, or manage your finances if you don't know how many hours you'll get or how much pay you're going to bring home? They tried to reason with the company, but nobody listened. So to get together, union members 
decided to strike. Those on guaranteed hours supporting those on zero hours. The strong helping the weak. And they won. Or ask the midwives. You could even call one. 133 years of the Royal College of Midwives and never a day of industrial action. But after years of below inflation increases, they went on strike for a pay rise. Not much, just the modest 1% their independent pay review body said they were entitled to and that the government could afford. But the government said no. Now dedicated to the mothers and babies they serve, the midwives made sure that every woman giving birth got the help she needed. But I have to tell you, delegates, that spectacle of midwives proud in their uniforms, standing on picket lines alongside other health workers, that is one I'm never going to forget, and they won too. So when you ask the public, as we've done, when you ask the public, do they support the right to strike? They get it. It's a fundamental human right. They know that sometimes employers can be unreasonable or just plain greedy. A strike is the last line of defence against those bosses who ignore or exploit staff or want to take advantage of their vocation to public service. Now, nobody would deny that strikes can be inconvenient, but when it comes to a threat to that fundamental right to strike, the public are with us, because that's exactly what this government is doing, attacking the very principle of the right to strike. Even the government's own independent watchdog has said that this bill is not fit for purpose. No evidence, no reason, rammed through at a rate of knots. Just think about the proposals on agency workers. For 40 years, employers have been banned from using agency temps to bust strikes. Because everyone understands that if you can just replace workers overnight, replace those strikers, that undermines all the power that workers have to bring to the bargaining table. Imagine the impact on the safety of whole workplaces run by untrained, inexperienced temporary staff. Think about what that would mean in education, energy or border control. But that is exactly what this government plans to do. And just think about the proposals to restrict lawful protests and picketing during a strike. Unions and their representatives required by law to produce two weeks in advance a protest plan and then hand it over to the boss, the authorities and the police. The protest plan has to set out every single detail. Will you be carrying a placard? A loud hailer? Are you going to tweet, post or Facebook? Are you going to be on YouTube? Will you write a blog? What exactly do you plan to say in that blog? All at two weeks notice. And not only that, each picket will have to have a named lead person and they will have to give their details to the police and their employer. Delegates, this is a recipe for victimisation. And in this movement, we know all about victimisation. For decades, big construction companies paid a fiver a time for the names of trade unionists who then mysteriously couldn't ever find work again in the industry, stripped of their livelihoods, all because in a dangerous industry, they stood up for fellow workers to keep them safe. Now, imagine that, but in every unionised workplace. Employers and the police crawling through tweets and Facebook posts, gathering the names of picketers, 
online and offline surveillance on a massive scale. And all at a time when the police are stretched thin and even their leaders admit they may not be able to attend every burglary report. What a massive waste of police time. What's more, more than 70% of the public agree with us. Of course, there's more attacks on political funds, limits on the time reps can spend representing their members, attacks on check-off too, and new thresholds on ballots that turn every abstention into a no vote. The government says it's all because it wants to see higher turnouts. Do me a favour. If that was really what the government wanted, they would allow us to use secure, electronic and workplace balloting. <laughs> After all, delegates, if Conservative Party members can choose their candidate for London Mayor by voting online, then why can't we exercise our democratic right to strike by voting online? But I think it would be a mistake to see this attack on unions in isolation. I believe that it's part of a political strategy to keep the Conservatives in power for a generation. And we need to take this power grab seriously. They know that globalisation has created losers as well as winners. They know that extremely unequal societies can become extremely unstable. So they've been taking lessons from right-wing friends around the world, US Republicans, Tony Abbott in Australia. Although news just in, you may be aware, Tony Abbott is no longer the Prime Minister in Australia. But anyway, the key lesson, I believe, that the Conservative Party is taking, they want to target those blue-collar workers who feel forgotten, derided and ripped off, who can't see any future of skilled jobs or a decent reward for a hard week's work. Then tell them that the Tories are on their side. Tell them that they feel their pain. Tell them that it's all the migrants' fault and whip up hatred of claimants. And then try and steal the TUC's clothes by promising the working poor a pay rise. Never mind that most people on benefits are working, and never mind that migrants are no different to any other worker, hoping for a better life, contributing to our country, facing the same struggle any other worker faces to earn a decent living. Just like my family, who came here from Ireland, just like many of your families here in the hall. And then there's the European Union, our country's Prime Minister, in an undignified scuttle around the capitals of Europe, thumping tables, desperate to find some red meat to chuck to his back benches. If, da if David Cameron was really battling for blue-collar Britain, He'd be fighting for stronger rights, not weaker ones. He'd be trying to stop bosses getting away with pitting worker against worker to undercut pay. He'd be fighting for an investment plan so that young people got good job opportunities and fighting against those trade agreements like TTIP and the secret courts that come with them to stop big corporations cannibalising our public services. But I think we need to wake up because the Conservative Party no longer represents the interests of industry in general. Its main purpose now is to serve just one, global finance. It's become the political wing of the City of London. Money and only money talks in today's Conservative Party. The national interest trumped by vested interests the common good sold for a quick buck. Now, you know that, Lab uh, that the Conservatives take every opportunity there is to claim that Labour 
is in the pocket of the unions. As if the small amounts of hard-earned money given freely by nurses, shop workers, refuse collectors was something to sneer about. But the Conservative Party is in a pocket that is a whole lot larger and it belongs to just a handful of rich men. There is only one way George Osborne's strategy to divide people and crush dissent will succeed, and that is if people of good conscience stay silent. But I can tell you this, the government has woefully miscalculated the resilience of working people and their trade unions. Because let me make it clear, and I want us all to send a strong message from this hall, with every ounce of our strength, we will oppose this bad trade union bill. Now, I am very proud to be a trade unionist. I am proud of our values rooted in putting working people first, proud that we're fighting for a society where no one gets left behind. And I know that you feel that pride too. That's why we say to every worker worries about their future, everybody who wants not just a job, but a career, everybody who wants enough time to spend with the people they love and a decent home to live in, join us, join a trade union, be part of our movement because together we are strong. So delegates, I ask you to support the campaign plan endorsed by your general counsel for a fair economy, for strong rights at work, for great jobs for everyone, world-class public services and for a free trade union movement. Let's unite, let's stand proud together and let's fight to win. Thank you.